is, is a brassy young lady who always yells things at me when I'm, when I'm uh, making announcements. She's a poet, an artist, living in San Francisco and pursuing her MFA in poetry at SFSU. She is a Kundaman Fellow, recipient of the William Dickey Fellowship, the San Francisco Foundation's Fellow Award, the Anfield's Poetry Award, and the Catherine A. Manoogian Scholarship. She folds cranes obsessively as a performative act with no desire to develop the art further. The crane as a symbol is irrelevant and arbitrary. She believes the over 10,000 cranes she's made over a three year period is merely a byproduct of coping with, among other concerns, the disenchantment of earning a fine arts graduate degree during a recession. Let's, let's all thank Carolyn for reminding us. Be reminded okay, all the time because most of the people here are suffering as, as I'm suffering. You're suffering. I am, right, for like the past five years. <laughs> so I'm like a super, 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 super senior grad. I'm so, I, I was a TA. <laughs> Sorry, not a yeah, a GIA. Um, and the person I GIA for went into the graduate program and has graduated. So I've been here a while. Um, and I'm, I'm not ashamed. Okay. So uh, and to further what Jason said, also, um, this is going to be a really, 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 really good show. Um, it's going to have a lot of uh, transgressive people, paintings, um, transgendered individuals. I think it's a lot of um, art that hasn't been seen in the city, and I really advocate for it just as a um, something to experience, to witness, to educate um, oneself on. There's so many different perspectives, and, and this I don't think gets a lot of attention, so. Anyway, moving along. So uh, there was a prompt about you in a class, and I wrote this title called T Twinkie. Um, is everyone familiar with um, Twinkies? The food, the hostess? Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Twinkies. They have stopped making Twinkies. The soft yellow cake and cream filling, a pillow cloud on the tongue, the center is so light, almost nonchalant, so ageless. It overcomes the world with high fructose sweetness. It extends itself with saccharine pleasantries. It labors on, quiet on the shelf. It is aspirationally internal, never alone, always with a twin, always neatly packaged and well put together. Everyone would be lucky to be called a Twinkie. So few things are resilient as a name, and so few things are as clear as cellophane. Like schoolboys calling out to you, nothing is as true as childhood. The perfect promise of never forgetting oneself. Nothing can be called a Twinkie that isn't a Twinkie. So here are my footnotes. Twinkies actually have a shelf life of 25 days, and they usually stay in the store for 10. And they don't last forever, but bigotry might. So that's just a footnote type of thought. <laughs> Number two, Twinkies um, have resumed distribution as of July 2013 and now are internationally available again. International diarrhea. The Twinkies scare began when Hostess declared bankruptcy, but a Canadian company rescued them and improved the Twinkies to last 45 days instead of the 20. <laughs> and the world felt safe again. <laughs> Uh, invented in 1930s, Twinkies were originally made with a banana cream filling, but during World War II, bananas were rationed, so the filling switched to vanilla. A banana is also a common slang for an Asian person who acts white. This is amazing. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm not done. Oh, I'm sorry. Stop laughing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. No. Oh, wait. I don't know. Okay. Um, so, I feel nervous reading dog poems. I have a dog. I have two. Two. I have two. And they, um, sometimes I say one because I like one more than the other. I ignore that the other one exists sometimes. Yeah, I know. I'm just honest. How old is Chewie now? Chewie is very old, and the other one's like a pup, so there's a reason why I'm shutting the other one. But I try not to do it visibly in front of him. I try 
try to hug the other one in a room quietly, and then the other one's like just eating dinner. Or okay. Um, so maybe we'll save that for last. So here's the whole thing. <laughs> Approximately, this is just a creative nonfiction thing that I'm supposed to do tomorrow, but I don't know what I'm doing. A lottery ticket is approximately three inches square. The color is off orange, perhaps, and off yellow, and meant to emulate the sun. In fact, the logo of the California lottery is a sun with a large L in the center for losers. <laughs> Here are important facts. One, one of the most frightening statistics is that you are eight thousand times more likely to be a victim of murder than win the lottery jackpot using the normal entry. <laughs> Two, the odds of winning a lottery jackpot are so low that actually traveling to buy your ticket gives you a statistically higher chance of dying than winning the top prize. <laughs> oh, and those are like off the internet, so that's actually really true, but I think that they are, they sound right. Um, despite these glaring facts, my mother every Sunday goes to the bank, stops at the grocery store, hits the post office, and without fail finds some new hot spot or any nearest place or some random place to buy a lotto ticket. You'll never win if you don't try, she says, and winks. Her hand takes the ticket momentarily, surveys the date and the number of rows she's picked, and pauses. The pause is slight. Maybe it lasts for a second, half a second, but the flinch is enough to imagine she is dreaming. She imagines a Hawaiian vacation, leather handbags. Briefly, she's entered a slow motion clip of herself driving a luxury sports car with the top down and pulling into a long luxury estate driveway, her sunglasses reflecting the glare of the sun and her hair pulled up and covered by a silk scarf as a Hollywood starlet in the 1960s would be. Or maybe her dreaming is simpler, wholesome, modest, Maybe she dreams of paying all her bills, of buying limitless groceries, of getting an air conditioner and new sneakers. Maybe she just can't imagine that much wealth, and she only senses its luminescence, as if the orange-yellow is a beacon, and she can revive herself from the world of uncertainty and darkness. She takes the ticket gingerly from a cashier and tucks it tenderly into her wallet for safekeeping. And despite this ritual, the compulsion to spend exactly $5 so devotedly to the California State Lottery, she has no specific liquor store or supermarket, no set of lucky numbers, no amulet. She rubs no prayer. She, oh, no amulet, she rubs, huh? She rubs no prayer. Um, so no prayer, she mutters, and when she gets home, the whole thing is sedate, followed by a nap. The act of winning is the act of trying. Actually winning is fate. The machine automates her numbers and the machines print her destiny. She never blames the machines, the cashier, or the weather. When she loses, she assumes she is meant to be poor. Something about her birth date, her lot in life, her yearly trips to the fortune teller tell her it's not the right time. All signs point to her karma, a broken promise perhaps in another life. She doesn't throw dishes or yell at the TV or get up abruptly and start cleaning to calm herself. No, she holds her breath and waits for the numbers to stop bouncing. For the numbers in her hand to match those on the screen. But they don't match. And she laughs. And she says, next time. She says she'll buy me everything I want, but next time. And each week, each Sunday, she waits, convinced that her weekly devotion to the lotto god the large L dancing and swaying on the screen will somehow amount to something someday. But over 30 years and 1,500 weeks later, over $7,000 lost, and nothing but little bits of paper jammed all over my house and forget-me-not dreams of karma strewn under her bed and her cupboards. She says she's right, though. You don't win if you don't try. And so much of life is hope, relentless hope. Oh, that didn't turn out well. Okay, sorry, moving on. That was good. Yeah, thanks. Press his head low, the 
light of a pale moon, the powerful wind, his tongue a wild dancer. Sorry. <laughs> That's an imagist poem, and I just think it's beautiful in a weird way. Sorry. Okay. Dog training. Oh, this is not good either. Um, <laughs> dog training. I will let my dog whine while he's in the other room. He cries and barks and begs, and I let him, so he suffers, so he knows how to cry out for someone and to have no one come to know what pain is and to adjust to it. I live, leave him alone as much as my heart will let me listen. I let him get mauled by larger dogs he tries to play with so he understands friendship. Let him eat rotten food from the garbage so he can feel what the body will do against him. Let him get raped by my cousin's sheepdog so he knows what control means. I let him live to hear him cry. And when he's vomiting or bleeding or wailing in the other room, I don't do this. Um, for as long as I can, practicing how to lose something I love over and over again. Practice as I will when he dies suddenly a decade from now on a vet's table. Practice in the other room, losing silently as I think of losing my mother, each one of my friends, and if I'm lucky, losing my husband. Watching as I lose myself to aging, and as soon as my dog stops yelping, I go to him, I hold him, I tell him soon. In case of natural disaster, I hold my new puppy. He's the size of waking up in the morning with the lightness of starting over. When the dog and I wake in the brief daylight, I fit his body under my arm and I imagine I am the immaculate mother with her infant God and drape sheets around us and imagine how I would sacrifice myself. I turn to kiss his head, his small, <laughs> so ridiculous, his small ears beside me. I would let him eat my body if I were trapped. I would let him feed forever, hands, torso, shake, ribs, eat my son, entrails falling from his mouth, eat and live without me. My fiance doesn't agree, he would let the dog die, he would let the dog go and, and eat it if necessary. Um, <laughs> I was so awkward with a live dog and not my own dog because I feel no inhibition with my own dog, like I can say mean things, but when there are other people's dogs around, I feel really insecure. So, uh, yeah, that's it. So thank you.